The Sopranos portrays a lot of video games authentically, and that's one of many reasons the show is good to watch more than once. The Mario Kart scene in Season 1 might be the least authentic though, and since you already heard the bits about how resetting the console doesn't restart a race, and the way Tony's holding the controller doesn't match the gameplay on screen, instead, this. Working on a high score. Now for AJ to say he's working on a high score seems a bit off since this is a racing game, but AJ could be referring to the points system in a Grand Prix. Tony explains that his cheating methods are just a handicap. It's called a handicap. Come on, stop him. Which is a valuable video game lesson since Smash Bros has that as early as this, the N64 generation. A handicap of one drastically weakens the knockback of your attack. It's a fun area of experimentation in tool-assisted gameplay, and this lovely father-son moment is guest-starring Charles Martinet, whose voice as Mario is technically uncredited, I suppose. So how things going with you? You probably thought this was just a quick video game cameo, you know, fun little easter egg in this scene, but no. This is actually the start of season 1's Nintendo 64 arc, which continues in episode 7, when AJ receives his punishment sentencing at the dinner table. Like a miserable. Anthony, I thought this could wait till after dinner. But your father and I have talked. You are not to play Mario Kart or go skateboarding for three weeks. That's the New Jersey pronunciation of Mario. Mario was a plumber from the greater New York area, so a lot of people would call him Mario. By Carmela's wording, you can tell that Mario Kart is the main game he's been playing lately, so Mario Kart itself is a massive punishment, without even needing to ban all video games. Well, the consequences of this Mario Kart sentencing echo in Season 3, Episode 3. What good has Carmela's parenting done? Not much because again, AJ storms away from the table, with Carmela name dropping Mario in a different capacity. Hey AJ, cheerleaders, any hotties, huh? There's no cheerleaders for freshman ball. These are Mario Batali string beans with Parmesan. Name dropping Mario's beans after another sassy AJ moment shows that the punishment did not work. He is spoiled and he wants nothing to do with his heritage because the Mario he will remember drives a go-kart. Now actually toward the end of the season one punishment episode, Tony misremembers the specifics of the penalty sanctions. You're not depressed. You're sad and you're angry because you did something stupid and you got grounded. You can't watch TV, you're playing your fucking computer for two and a half weeks. Referencing the computer instead of the actual Mario Kart ban is just another example of Tony not really following up on the consequences that the parents laid down. So there AJ is thinking to himself like, hey, actually N64 wise it was just Mario Kart. So AJ could take a glimpse at his library of less preferred N64 games and find the game portrayed in the episode immediately after this one. It's Blast Corp. <laughs> He's allowed to play it because it is not Mario Kart, which is a glowing endorsement for the game. It's his go-to when Mario Kart is not allowed. Blast Core is a metaphor for the destruction Tony causes, demolishing buildings and structures, draining away the dollars until there's nothing left. And what's your motivation in this game? The whole plot is to clear a path for nuclear weapons. AJ's learning from the best about how to plow into Davy Scatino's business, to pave a path for the big guns. The banjo music in the first level of this game actually did become a rareware staple, but AJ would probably be embarrassed if his friends heard it possibly, so it's not a game he would suggest playing when pals are over the house. The fact that feds show up at the back door is just another example of how Tony is in denial that he can protect his family members from the chaos and trauma of his lifestyle. His kid can't even play a damn rareware game without federal agents inviting themselves into the backyard. So, our Nintendo 64 episode count is already at a robust 3, with the Rareware episode total starting out at 1. In the next season, the first video game appearance is in episode 9, at the hospital after those two D-bags shoot Chris. During hospital downtime, AJ has a Game Boy Color, playing Pokemon Pinball. It does seem the show's creators definitely wanted us to know which game AJ was playing, because most Game Boy games would be very difficult to see, but Pokemon Pinball has a larger, unmistakable shape that includes a AAA battery compartment to power this game's rumble vibration feature. State-of-the-art tech indeed. 
It shouldn't surprise the game was developed by the same team that made the Game Boy Camera, leading the charge of portable gaming gimmickry. This full-price standalone game has two total pinball tables. Get it? Like Pokemon Red and Blue. You catch Pokemon by slamming a ball on it four times, and completing the Pokedex of 151 monsters is how this game gets mileage out of the total two tables it offers. Each table has a top and bottom half, and the camera cuts to white every time you move from one to the other. The sequel solution was a scrolling camera, but it has the makings of motion sickness, where your stomach feels like a pouch of patriciable waste. But Sega does what Nintendo don't. Look at Sonic Pinball Party's superior palatable camera motion. Still, Nintendo gets credit for the quality of life option to map both flippers to a single button press. And if AJ discovered this feature, it was likely he activated it. Keep in mind, this is the episode where Carmella pressures Tony to get a vasectomy to remove the possibility of mistakenly creating a new human with Irina Peltzen or someone else. Tony is reluctant to get the snip snip because his only male heir drops food, spills drinks, and is focused on catching fantasy pocket monsters, while his uncle Chris is glimpsing a genuine vision of the afterlife or an easily explainable near-death hallucination. In the episode right after this one, AJ has a swimming race where he places third, or as he markets it to his mom. That was so exciting! If I wouldn't have banged my foot on the flip turn, I would have came in second. Later that day, he plays a different game, one where he has a lot more control and capacity to win. Yet still, even here he's bumping up against the wall, just like at the swimming race. I guess the race car doesn't fall far from the manufacturer. After all, that wall crashing is just like his dad did in Season 1's Mario Kart session. But this is the Sega Dreamcast game, Kart, flag to flag. Most importantly, the front of the box has the Sega Sports insignia, which AJ would have seen, which is great. Now you hear the word Kart in the title, but unfortunately it's Kart with a C, which is the rather square Championship Auto Racing Teams, which is an IndyCar racing organization that went defunct in 2003. This was a launch title. Perhaps not AJ's first choice, but he was getting a Dreamcast and that's what was there and available. It's a pretty bare bones game, the courses are mostly boring variations of ovals. Safe to say that as far as console launch titles go, Kart Flag to Flag is outshined by a game like Project Gotham Racing 3 at the Xbox 360 launch. It outshines Flag to Flag as a launch title in terms of customer satisfaction, and that does include adjusting for the fact that they came out in different generations. AJ turns off the TV, but not the console. So later, at the moment where Tony kicks the Dreamcast controller, This is the day you have trained for. The day you have studied for. Utilize your superior skills. Your superior intelligence. Sega Dreamcast. If you've never watched The Sopranos before, should you watch the rest of this video despite some targeted spoilers? I'm gonna now suggest that yes, you should. First of all, bro, you've had 25 years to watch the program. And if you ignored Cybershell's direct order to watch all six seasons, what are you even doing to begin with? Most surprises and plot points will not be spoiled in this video, and I would actually contend that the targeted spoilers that are in this video will actually enhance your first viewing of the show. Because the thing is, most viewers do largely enjoy the ride on a first viewing, but the last season can seem aimless and pointless and culminating in what can feel like a disappointing cop-out finale. I remember when I first read the script, I thought I was missing pages, just like people thought their TVs had broken. Well, I've had so many people say to me about the ending, so what the hell was that? And I'm like, you know, I know pretty much what you do. And they're like, all right, I get it, but, but what really happened? <laughs> but these reactions are within expected parameters of the show's intentional design, and the questions that seemingly lack answers actually do have a great many clues to be discovered on repeat viewings. So finishing your first watch is itself the beginning of a viewership journey, a journey that never completely ends. I'm still making discoveries and connecting dots even after all this time. The best way to say it is that one does not re-watch The Sopranos. You are only ever watching it, no matter
matter how many times you've seen it all the way through, which is why I never use the word replay when it comes to masterpiece games like Super Metroid and Sonic 3. In that way, I regard the most important watch as maybe the third or fourth, which you might think that's unreasonable to watch a show that many times, that it requires an unreasonable commitment, but the thing is The Sopranos is a perfect show to just have on as background, with your attention coming and going organically depending on what things you happen to be interested in at any given point of your viewership journey. So, with that disclaimer established, it's showtime. If we consider AJ's video game journey through the series so far, Flag to Flag and all the games we've seen are part of the first of two categories, Games of Innocence, and in the second half of the series, Games of Experience in seasons 4, 5, and 6. An important through line of the show is the way Tony's subconscious recognizes that he's in over his head, but his conscious self plows ahead, insisting that all his hard work is for his family, and they ought to be grateful. I work hard all day to pay for this 6,000 square foot house, big screen TVs, food on the table, video games, all kinds of scooters and bicycles, Columbia University, and for what? To come home to this? But material wealth and violent problem solving is not the foundation of a stable family, and this delusion is the slow motion car crash we all witness over six seasons. So in the first three seasons, the wholesome games of AJ's childhood are his innocence, potential, the experimental playtime in the same primordial soup in which Kevin Finnerty lives, a what if of what could have been if the person's nature had been brought up with a different nurture. But we know AJ is on a fast track to destructive selfishness, so video game wise, how does season 3 conclude this era of the games of innocence? When AJ has a moment to shine in real life sports, where does his mind go? You should be riding high after what you did on the field today, come on! Wanna play some Nintendo? You and me? When are you gonna throw that friggin' thing out the friggin' window? This proto-AJ is still clinging on to his wholesome innocence, but what does Tony do? Pulls him away to instead shovel hot dogs into his mouth by the car load. But what's important is that AJ relents. He agrees to go just get hot dogs instead, just as he will accept Tony's offer to hang out with those college kids and torture a debtor. The first real signs of trouble happen during the driveway scene, where Tony tries once and for all to clarify the house's orange juice policy. It says with pulp. You like it with pulp? Not this much. I like the one that says some pulp. AJ arrives from his Washington DC trip and the only thing he reports is the PlayStation 2. Well, how was it? It was pretty good. They had PlayStation 2 right in the hotel room. And? The PS2 launch was in October 2000, and since season 3 was filmed in the autumn of 2000, the PS2 would have been brand spanking new, so this must have been a really deluxe hotel that Carmela picked out for AJ. So again, we see AJ's lack of quality because by parenting choices, to put him in such a luxurious hotel whose amenities distracted his attention from the Washington Monument and the classic Statue of Lincoln. Two episodes later, we have an episode title again centered around AJ, so it can't be overstated how important AJ is as a character to the overall narrative, and video games help us better understand him. This episode's new punishments include the clause, You're grounded for a month. That means no Nintendo, no DVDs, no skateboards. And no computer. This raises the stakes of punishment from no Mario Kart, since AJ worked around that punishment with Blast Core. What we see trending here is the severity of the Soprano's parents' punishments, but what you come to realize throughout the series is that the Soprano parents keep doing the same thing but expect a different result. When he gets expelled from his school Verbum Day, Verbum Day, Carmela's idea is to ship him to a school with a similar name that sounds just like more of the same. Burnwood Day, it's for troubled kids, if a psychologist right on staff. No. Against Carmela's wishes, Tony raises the stakes by reviewing brochures for a military school. Which, hello, the season finale's title is another AJ reference. These season 3 endgame punishments are the last time the Soprano parents were, on the surface, trying to incentivize good behavior. Skip forward a season finale and the behavior incentive is now bribery, and AJ scoffs in their face about a cursing policy. You're fined three dollars for the F word. I heard dad say mother F when I was coming down the stairs. He's fine too. We're gonna make this policy work. It's too late. Season 3 marks the milestone where Tony's son starts growing up, for better or worse. 
The AJ of experience can game people more effectively. He grows more deliberate and conniving and becomes a smooth talker. From here on out, both AJ and Meadow are gonna win the battle against their parents, but not win in a way that necessarily benefits their interests. They win in terms of besting their parents and winning the argument in the moment. And the futility of these ostensible punishments is exposed in the very next episode. One episode after the no Nintendo punishment, he gets a whole new console, PS1. This is it, the beginning of the end. But why a PS1, since this is after the earlier episode's PS2 name drop? Well, since this was the Christmas of the PS2's launch year, it's very expensive and has a limited library. PS1 is affordable and has a massive library of games, some of which are already discounted. You know, greatest hit selects, all that stuff. So the pragmatic choice of PS1 is one of AJ's first smart moves, but with it, dies his innocence. So begins the era of games of experience. Which brings us to an exciting segment, Xbox Crimes. So it's time to put your trivia hats on. Which Sopranos characters are guilty of criminal acts pertaining to Xbox products? Well, we all know that the first culprit that comes to mind is, of course, Janice. Listen, I, I can't stay. I, I just brought Bobby Jr. a couple of Xbox games a friend of mine burned for him. Jojo! And it is possible Bobby Jr. specified which games he wanted to be burned. But knowing Janice, she would be capable of making an unsolicited offering of burnt games. The disc has writing on it that's maybe too blurry to see, but it's reasonable to expect it was a true game of the time handwritten on the disc, like maybe Max Payne. Does Janice's method of giving free, expensive gifts work to win over Bobby's kids? It's a pretty strong pull. In season six, you get a taste of the kids begging for that sweet Xbox nectar. Can I play the Xbox? What happened to folding the napkins? These kids are now accustomed to feeding on blood money, but did this approach work on Bobby Jr.? Six episodes after the burned Xbox comments, Bobby Jr. is playing Max Payne, a game released for Xbox and PC. But since Bobby is playing it on his PC, Janice is still not succeeding at connecting. Xbox games are hard to pirate, and Janice's games might not have worked on his console model. The visuals seem to be the game's intro, but he is pressing the PC keyboard as if he is playing it, so it's not the most authentic portrayal. Unless he was just booting up the game and was mashing the volume to make sure he didn't miss that cool part of the intro. The rest of his screen is AOL America Online, so this might be a trailer available at AOL keyword Max Payne. Max Payne's iconic Matrix-style bullet time gameplay foreshadows the second to last episode of the series, Blue Comet, where Bobby is killed in Max Payne bullet time fashion. And that's in an episode with two other scenes in which both generations of Xbox consoles are represented. Janice is intentionally exacerbating the problem of a preoccupation with Karen's ghost, so she can get Bobby Sr. to stop ruminating on Karen. So would you believe that the Max Payne scene is only one of two examples in this episode where video games are paired with the occult? Because yes, in the same episode when visiting the Soprano house, Bobby's kids are sent to AJ's room to hang out and play some games. Naturally, AJ's mind goes to Ouija board, raising the stakes to a full-on seance. But of course it goes south, and the adults intervene, and with the lights turned on, all is revealed on the shelf. AJ's library of Sega Saturn games. Between this and the Dreamcast, we now know for sure that on some important level, AJ was a Sega kid. Tony and Carm probably shuddered at the idea of a young AJ having the distraction of video games in his room at all times. But now that he's grown up, they're like, whatever. AJ had a Dreamcast and Saturn, both consoles that were considered failures, because the Dreamcast got discontinued early with Sega's departure from the hardware business, and the Saturn had a serious library volume problem. Out of over a thousand Saturn games, only a couple hundred even released in the US. So this is one domain where AJ is jaded and disillusioned by lack of payoff and creative, free-spirited game design further pushing him into the arms of PlayStation, and more importantly, Xbox, with the comfort food of conveyor belt algorithm cookie cutter games delivered each holiday season with a homogenized consistency made possible by corporate muscle. The Saturn setup is the final echo of AJ's good-natured childhood innocence. He now goes out of his way to punch down upon the next generation. By the time he enters the workforce, these roles of the hunter and the hunted are the status quo. And what do you expect when AJ takes his cues from from Hernan. I was Hernan. He was such a dick in high school. Well, he was a senior. What do you expect? 
And there was shit on the underclassmen. This episode is the culmination of the keynote landmark event. AJ's employment at the Blockbuster Video Rental Store. Which you would think is an obvious excuse to spot like iconic movie posters like Analyze This or Godfather Special Edition. But nope, since this is The Sopranos after all. Film history gets bumped in place of the much more pressing cultural event, the Xbox 360 launch. Throughout this scene you can see a variety of posters for Xbox 360 launch titles. Project Gotham Racing 3 is pound for pound a better launch title racing game than Kart Flag to Flag on Dreamcast. We see deliberate placement of actors to block and then reveal posters for Xbox 360 launch games, including Cameo, Elements of Power, by the development studio Rareware. Pokemon was the primary inspiration for this game, catching and training monsters to fight other creatures, but in real time 3D. So this is the honorable mention of the series 3 Pokemon episodes. AJ likely passed on the GameCube, but if Bobby Jr. got it the year of launch, he'd have seen this game right on the console's box, but it never came out on GameCube or anywhere that generation. Development took too long and spiraled onto Xbox at the Microsoft acquisition, but then it didn't even make it to market on Xbox. The game's core vision was far too passive and tedious, so they extended development to have the player take control of these monsters for combat. So this was a big payoff of Rareware's acquisition by Microsoft for $375 million, two would-be Nintendo games to round out the Xbox 360 launch library, because the other Twycross presence in this scene is Perfect Dark Zero. This series has two games, and the first N64 game is regarded as a mechanically superior successor to Rareware's GoldenEye. It's never been adapted into a movie, and has an alien character named Elvis, who belongs in Banjo-Tooie more than this. You play as Joanna, who looks like Nassim Pedrad in the TBS show Chad, where she plays a 12-year-old boy. You play as a lady, and 100% of the enemies are men. This ludonarrative horseradish took a different turn in the 360 prequel game with the additional attribute of this voice acting. You okay? I could use an aspirin. But the tribes of Earth grew jealous of their powers and turned on their gods. Their gods! Rareware offset this with a sexy redesign that graced the cover of a gentleman's magazine. At least Perfect Dark Zero has a solid suite of co-op and multiplayer modes, but that is a baseline expectation for the successor to Goldeneye. There was a lot to unpack with these Xbox 360 launch posters, and Matt McMuscles has excellent episodes of what happened on each of these games. That is some premium content. Ah, to be employed at Blockbuster. What a ways we've come from the season one mention of a mom and pop outfit. Making some hard choices. I told her she was not to use my card again. No, that's mine. One true thing, just out on DVD. I was over at Video One anyway. I thought maybe you might want to take your mind off these stressors. These video store mentions in the first and last seasons land in the pattern of this ultimate story of capitalism unleashed, where the rich get richer, the poor getting poorer, and the massive conglomerations absorb small business competitors. In the same way that Phil Leotardo and Butchie over in New York ultimately decide to absorb the New Jersey division that they've always scornfully regarded as a glorified crew. Blockbuster itself went on to be one day cornered and gutted by DVD by mail, Redbox, and streaming. And this domino effect plays into the overall dynamic that everything turns to poop, and it's all a big nothing. But keep in mind, although the series only has one scene in the store, this blockbuster arc is far from over, because yes, this is another instance in which video games are involved in arcs that cross multiple episodes. Which takes us to Season 6, Episode 11, where we learn that AJ was fired from Blockbuster for stealing posters and what Carmela calls stand-ups. He was taking promotional items and selling them, movie posters, stand-ups. Standees. Most of that stuff gets thrown out anyway. The store's policy was very clear. Yeah, well, maybe I care about the environment. Right, did that ever occur to you? Wallace and Gromit? I mean, that weighed like 50 pounds. How many trees gave their lives for that? It just goes to the dump. He would have been referring to Wallace and Gromit, Curse of the Were-Rabbit, which released in 05, and had a video game adaptation that was published by Konami. If you didn't know any better, you'd think this scene ties a nice neat bow at the end of the blockbuster arc. But later in the episode, AJ is seen gaming with Hernan and Rhiannon, playing Perfect Dark Zero on none other 
than an Xbox 360. Ladies and gentlemen, AJ stole an entire Xbox console from Blockbuster on the way out. If he was willing to steal posters and stand-ups, why would he stop there? Tony doesn't pay attention to the kids that he raises to the extent that he probably would not even notice a new console. Carmella would be much more likely to notice the new console and suspect foul play, since many of AJ's video game acquisitions have to be submitted for approval through Carm, so she can buy them for him at birthdays, holidays, or any day when he begs hard enough. But this is the AJ of experience. He's a step ahead of his parents and could easily explain it away by saying it was Hernan's Xbox 360, and that Hernan is such a cool guy that he's letting AJ hang on to the 360 for a while. But Tony is not going to take this fraternity lying down. He pops the balloon of AJ's chill hangout by giving the windshield a good old-fashioned Hulk smash. At the very least, AJ's way with words indicates that he's applied himself in many an English class, after powering through early struggles with Robert Frost. Look, I'm just gonna have to leave your friend in the lurch when I go back to school. That's okay, he deals with that all the time. I'd just as soon keep searching online. I'm sure you would and he will use his communication skills as a weapon for his ends moving forward. It would be reasonable to suspect that episode 11's prominent video game scene would result in a cool down in the next few episodes, but nope. The very next episode brings us what is debatably the third person on the show to commit an Xbox crime. But I bet you wouldn't have guessed our little amaretto cookie Carmella, who mentions she just got home from the annual toy drive at Marola's. How was you? It was nice. We gave an Xbox. Now this is not to suggest that somewhere a Best Buy display window is shattered with one less Xbox console behind it, but look, Blood Money funded this Xbox donation, because all the money Carmella gets either comes from Tony's money, which is acquired through extortion, violence, theft, or from the Spec House profits, which was very profitable because they skimped out on the type of wood, despite the real risk that the house may collapse as a result of the weak sauce lumber that the building code specifically forbids. So hopefully that Xbox provided a lot of joy for some lucky kid. But it was funded by organized crime that's prosecutable under RICO statutes. We're in the home stretch, culminating in the Sopranos penultimate episode, including the series' final video game cameos. But before coming to terms with AJ's fate, let's take a Wire-style look at the generation that rises up to replace him in the circle of society. Jason and Justin Blundetto. Their dad, Tony Uncle Al, is this show's cuddy, released from prison and trying to get it right this time, while struggling to resist the temptation of the profitable underground economy, and his own kids are part of what pushes him over the edge. They can't find a reason to care about their dad's massage startup, but Game Boy Advances are a different story. Hey guys, what do you think of daddy's business? Jason, Justin, I'm talking to you. I like it. Yeah, it's nice. Maybe someday when this thing takes off, you guys can work here, like as a summer job or something. Would you like that? Working with your own man? Sure. Since the kids don't actually play their Game Boys in this scene, we can deduce a thing or two about what happened off screen at GameStop. Dad must have told him, all right, you can each pick one game, but you're not playing them today until you finish homework. They knew they weren't going to play the GBAs in this scene, but with all the hype of a new portable console, they're just opening up the GBAs to take a look at the hardware and get hyped. Now it's a shame we don't see any games, because what a library of games this console has. The stuff that classic memories are made on. Instead, it's a boring afternoon working on a problem set in their workbooks. Tony takes the Game Boys and places them on the wall, and we're left to speculate about what could have been. But hold on. These books are shaped oddly, a little too square. Because they are not books. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at this scene's two never-before-reported Game Boy Advance games, lying there in plain sight all along. Tracking down these two games was in fact not the tedious odyssey you might expect, because as with a lot of things on this show, the clues are all there. The Game Boy Advance launched in 2001 and had been out for a couple of years when Season 5 was filming, so by then there was already a giant list of potential games. But given that the show time and again spotlights brand spanking new titles, David Chase seems to be hinting that the best place to start the search is by reviewing the back of each box of all GBA games released in the filming year of 03. Sure enough, both of these games were indeed released in this calendar year, the first of which is the real-time tactical 
RPG, Mega Man Battle Network 3 Blue version. Oh, baby. This is a game in one of multiple Mega Man spin-off series. And the first thing you'll notice is that blue version qualifier. Because yes, this series uses the Pokemon method of two simultaneously released versions that are mostly the same but have a few exclusive tidbits in each version that you can cross access with a game link cable. Lan and Mega Man cooperate to enter the internet and fight off cyber criminals and viruses, which happens to overlap with the movie script Tony pitches to AJ. So I got this screenplay from Dan Danny Baldwin. My long story short, it's about a private detective that got sucked into the internet through his uh, data port, and he's got to solve some murders of some virtual prostitutes. I read it. It's scary. If Pokemon games were structured with this game's combat system, I might have stayed a Pokemon player past Generation Red. You don't exactly play as Mega Man, rather you play as a human boy named Lan. If you find a computer or online terminal, what Lan can do is jack in to enter cyberspace. This Tobias Funke choice of words was bound to fly over Jason and Justin's heads. Entering cyberspace is this game's version of dungeons, and that's where random battles can happen. In here is where you play as Mega Man, and technically his name is Mega Man.exe. And no, that's not a callback to Cybershell's Mugen video. Mega Man.exe is even named on the back of the box. The sound effect that initiates a battle is incredible, and sounds just like the ah uh, yeah clip in Funky Kong's theme in Donkey Kong Country 1. The grid-based combat blends deck building and real-time action, so Tony B's young kid might have bitten off more than he can chew. As a barometer of this game's complexity, let's see the extent to which content creator Gerard the Constructionist grasped the game's mechanics. The Constructionist deck of cards is a mishmash of alphabet soup, which screws him in battle since each turn you can only draw more than one card if they're of the same letter code, two of a kind. Because of this, the Constructionist leans on the backup basic pea shooter, dealing one hit point per shot. The attack cards are disproportionately powerful, with the expectation that you really shouldn't be missing shots. By selecting attack cards tailored to an individual enemy's consistent movement patterns, so to whiff a major attack is a catastrophic error, as this will require you to wait out the next opportunity for cards, during which time all you can do is a paltry one damage hit point per shot. One highlight is this 80 damage attack with a one tile range. These enemies are literally not moving, but do you think that'll stop Gerard from swinging for the fences? Since the Constructionist was able to beat the game despite these brutally inefficient stumbles, he incorrectly attributed the frustration to design flaws, when actually all of his head-scratching questions had very specific explanations provided by the design choices he ignored. If an adult YouTuber can't even find his way with this game, could Tony B's young son Justin even tread water? Yes, he can. The Constructionist just needs to pay more attention to how all the different stats interlock and affect each other. See? What am I always saying? I hate this f***ing shit. Lots of people had no problem beating the game as kids, with many comments of the sort on Gerard's disappointing review. Tony B's kid might even have a leg up, advantaged with the makings of a statistician among boys. Tony Uncle Al has an IQ in the 150s, and after his stay in prison, he legitimately passed the massage licensing exam through sheer hard work and dedication to index cards. So since Tony B's son only has one game to play, he's gonna play the hell out of it and is well positioned to get the most out of it, just as these commenters did in their own childhood. So that leaves the other GBA game, and for a stark contrast against these high concept battle mechanics, the other twins game is The Incredible Hulk, also released in 03. This game was released to coincide with the 2003 Hulk movie with Edward Norton, although the game itself is actually based on the original comics, so it's encouraging that this kid is getting some version of a genuine slice of Marvel's history. But the game doesn't have much. You walk around and attack, avoiding and deactivating electrical shock floors. The music sounds like taking a loaded green diaper to the face. Listen to how dingy and miserable it is. So the difference between the two brothers' games couldn't be more significant. Creative puzzle solving and depth versus this Hulk game where you walk around and punch things, then continue doing it. That's the game. 
Each game reflects the mutually exclusive life paths that Tony B is juggling. On one hand, walking the straight and narrow to maintain a respectable living, running a legit business with a relaxing aesthetic of ginseng, fake rhino, nerve tea, all that herbal stuff and Tony Uncle Johnny will take care of the Koi acquisition, all the while needing to resist the temptation to cut corners and smash through life's problems with brute force muscle. But sadly, the deck is stacked against the kids. Tony B is gently escorting his children toward the path of impulsive aggression, and this is not the only hint of the kids' future fates. Proximity to riches at the Soprano house is not helping their chances. Playing with pool noodles should be innocent enough, but we watch in dread hoping they don't go on a Son of Gondor side quest to explore the secret forest of solitude and emerge at the virtual expressway where AJ amuses himself by pushing the driveway's speed limit. Immediately after this scene of Jason and Justin in the pool, it cuts to the whacking of Lorraine and the love of her life Jason, which she abbreviates to Jay so that the parallel to Tony B's kid isn't too on the nose. Jace? Are you knocking? She does articulate the full name Jason while sprinting across her home. But most viewers wouldn't notice this with the distraction of Lorraine's towel being off. The point inferred is that Jason Blundetto is primed to become just another mob adjacent knucklehead bound to receive an incidental slaughtering and some business conflict that won't amount to anything when it's all said and done. And back in the present, we see the camel's back finally break. The twins return for more pool access at Hugh's 75th birthday jubilee, given the chair cushions the Hulk treatment, and this is only the beginning. The kids' warpath includes stealing Olympic medals from AJ's house. Where are your game boys? That's mine. Jason's is in the drawer. I'm giving both of these to the Salvation Army. I didn't do nothing! The Salvation Army, where the Game Boys achieve salvation but not Tony B's boys. A one month ban would have been more appropriate, but these draconian measures stem from Tony Uncle Al's cognitive dissonance. You stole this from your cousin who opens his house to you? I found it on the floor way in back of AJ's closet. He doesn't care. With all the stuff he has, he got to go to the Olympics and everything. I love where he lives. I don't want to come back here. Tony Uncle Al is outdone by the wealth of his gangster cousin while he's busting ass at the laundry job or backbreaking work getting ready the ginseng vibe massage office, all to buy his kids Game Boys for them to just be preoccupied by the superior entertainment options at AJ's house. This is the pivotal moment that pushes Tony B back out of upstanding civilian life. If his kids will just covet their neighbor's property in a winter of discontent, then screw that noise, it's time for a Hulk smash. And sure enough, later in this very very episode is Tony B's whacking a Joey Peeps. The kids are surprisingly calm and resigned given that their Game Boys were just seized. So maybe Justin never figured out how to build a balanced deck in Mega Man Battle Network 3 and Jason got bored by the Hulk's repetitive combat and grating audio. This brute force removal of the video game component from a child's life is paralleled in the series' second to last episode, which marks the conclusion of the series' video game related arcs. Gaming is collateral damage when Tony and AJ butt heads within the powder keg that is the Soprano family, when their differing philosophies collide with one final crash. Tony lays out the road ahead of what the family expects from AJ, but he can barely keep it together, and Tony is simply not having this. He just slams the rage button with brute force, demanding AJ be the strong, silent type, going DEFCON 4, drag your offspring out of the bed and drop him to the ground with no regard for his tailbone. As Tony pulls, the Xbox tumbles off the shelf. Tony has always rejected the childish industry of gaming, the stuff of fairy tales, the babying and coddling that's racking up 2200 bucks a day at the psych facility. Tony strains to push AJ toward the strong silent path, even though time and again Tony fails to live as Gary Cooper did. Tony hates this about himself, and this fuels his violent rage toward his son, because he wants his son to be the man Tony frequently fails to be. Tony says this explicitly in the bedside chat of the Pokemon Pinball Vasectomy episode. And you and me, we, we react without thinking. That's why I get mad at you. You know, I, I see myself in you. As the Xbox tumbles, the Xbox game can be seen, Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball, 
One of the Dead or Alive games had a volleyball minigame, and they decided to make an entire spin-off game with deliberately sexy ladies in bikinis, which was developed by Team Ninja, the studio that did Metroid Other M. The publisher filed a lawsuit because modders altered the game so that the girls were fully nude. So here you have a game that was algorithmically designed to stimulate a maximum hormonal response, deliberately inducing the agony of imagining what's inside the suits. And for those gamers to imagine said treasures as a fan tribute mod led to the claim in the court of law that damage had been done to the reputation of the series. And if AJ sought out this game, there's blood on Tony's hands. It was just a few episodes ago that Tony's prescription for AJ's depression was the same shapes that the volleyball game has. But earlier in the episode at the psych facility, Tony is displeased about the excessive daily charges to pay for amenities such as an Xbox 360. The audio is from a Halo game, but which one? Halo 3 was the first Halo game on the 360, but its North American release was in September of 07. Since Blue Comet was filmed in February 07 and airing that June, it's unlikely that the Sopranos production team would have gotten hold of pre-release audio from Bungie. This console does have backwards compatibility though, and about half of the original Xbox's library is backward compatible if your 360 has a hard drive. Halo 1 and 2 are supported games, but Halo 2 has unresolved minor graphical issues where ghosts of assets appear where they don't belong. Fix that Halo 2. So is all this talk of ghost assets and halos just more examples of piling on the death-related imagery for the final season, overwhelmingly hinting at a morbid fate for Tony or even members of his family? AJ is particularly pale in these psych ward scenes. Is a halo just deepening the suggestive imagery? A halo is associated with good behavior, but the word halo more directly refers to the optical phenomenon that happens as a ring around a source of light. An important Sopranos image is a circular beacon of light, this light symbol that transfixes Tony on multiple occasions, ultimately the catalyst for his epiphany about the nature of everything that exists and his place in it. The beacon appears when you have a dust up with death. It's the infinity of everything that exists. When Kevin Finnerty's on the edge of the afterlife, the beacon flashes like a lighthouse. AJ's brushing up with his generation's version of the beacon of light, and he's pale as a ghost. And any theory about AJ's potential death must consider the 2022 scene outside a bar's landing seafood. There's an obvious hearse in the background behind AJ, and he's dressed in all black with his neck sort of resembling a priest collar, and his intro has a lighthouse beacon in the same spot as AJ when he enters the scene in the next shot, which are all solid clues, but certainly not a smoking gun that AJ is a ghost. Could all these clues be simultaneously consistent with a theory where AJ lives? For this video's pseudo finale, we will explore the counter argument in which AJ is in fact not killed at Holston's. As with many Soprano theories, let's trace back the clues to the opening montage in the pivotal season 6 premiere episode. Which certainly provides a glimpse at Tony's deal, but also Anthony Jr. His portion of the montage is the first moment where the song switches to a major key, with a definitively major tonic 1 chord whereas everything that came before it is definitively minor key. And listen to what the narrator has to say, delivered in a voice nearly identical to that of hospital pal John Schwinn. Number five is the guy, the double, most closely associated with the subject. The car, which usually reaches adolescence at the time of bodily death, is the only reliable guide through the land of the dead. Now this doesn't necessarily mean AJ has some canon role as a supernatural guide between the living and dead, although it is suggested by the fade out in the spec house immediately following AJ's selfie during class. And the ocean backdrop of Bar's Landing restaurant invokes the sea and seafood, which means something specific on this show. Ready for the surprise twist kicker? The Bar's Landing coastline does not represent the ocean of the afterlife realm per se, because the body of water behind the restaurant is not the open ocean, but actually a bay of the Atlantic. And they do show you that during the drive-in. The peninsula is where this bridge is to. 
But make no mistake, the ocean is very much right there, and New York not far behind it. The Soprano siblings have not gotten off scot-free. But if Tony is the subject, then Luca is his double, set to walk down the same roads Tony has, providing solace not just to Tony, but to the whole Soprano clan, assuming his role as a steward of death a shot caller, and this is foreshadowed as early as the season 1 Mario Kart episode, in the final scene at the funeral. Did you notice anything about the music at this funeral gathering? The chords are replicated in the Hotel Beacon scene, at the end of its own episode. It's even in the same key. The main difference is what's called a deceptive cadence, where you swap in a 6 chord in the spot where you could otherwise deliver resolution on the 1 chord. AJ's debut gig in this capacity is breaking the news to Meadow about an untimely death, and that's in front of the backdrop of his Sega Saturn games. He certainly inherited his father's desensitation of violence. One starts to suspect that Tony is to horses as AJ is to liberal political causes. Geopolitical conflict becomes the object of AJ's displaced compassion, since that compassion is unwelcome in a culture that mutilates debtors and belittles bicycle collisions. AJ doesn't get his hands dirty. He watches the fireworks from an insulated distance. It's quite the nurture over nature. AJ Finnerty has ceased to exist, and the idea that the Cod double comes of age as Tony the subject arrives at bodily death suggests AJ keeps living when Tony's time ends. The natural order of things. And here he is with Tony's couple of semesters in higher education before dropping out, the way his dad bailed out of Seton Hall. The role AJ is said to serve is informed by the Blue Comet bedside chat. Tony pitches AJ the basic premise of the man AJ must become and continue to be in Tony's absence. I'm gonna be dependent on you to help out your mother. Well, help out how? Just do what she asks. Don't break her balls, all right? Huh? Help her with Aunt Janice, whatever. You definitely spotted the Xbox behind T, right? Well, during the line driving home AJ's family role, Tony completely blocks all Xbox visibility. Playtime is over. Like it or not, AJ becomes the reluctant hero, holding together his family in the face of what's next. Plus, AJ's musical sequence in the series finale has a song that's decidedly upbeat, with lyrics that call out the year 2025 specifically. This translates to Too Towsy Tumpy Fi in the Simlish language version recorded for The Sims Pet Stories, with instructions to scratch your name into the fabric of this world. Tony's male heir is a spoiled replica of his own self. As of the show's 25th anniversary, AJ's mortal fate remains open to interpretation, and all the while, David Chase gave us a masterful tapestry in which to explore the question of whether Anthony John Soprano Jr. is dead or alive. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Know all about it, real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed a nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Okay, people, it's time for the Many Games of New York, a bonus section of honorable mentions, indirect references, and tangential nuggets. As with the Sopranos prequel movie, the moment-by-moment -moment amounts of quality and relevance may vary significantly, and without warning. Oh, and in PAL territories, it's called the Many Games of Christopher. Christopher. In the episode Luxury Lounge, Christopher flies to Los Angeles to pitch a movie role to actor Ben Kingsley, who you may recognize from Paramount Plus commercials. Ben makes an efficient decision to conduct part of the movie pitch meeting at one of those events where they give away expensive goods to celebrities as an investment to kickstart brand awareness. It's got 20 gigs of space. That's 80 hours of video or 600 hours of music. And there's a booth with the PS2 game True Crime, New York City. 
The first game was in fact set in Los Angeles, where Ben Kingsley is, and they had a contest where you might win a car if you correctly guessed the city where the sequel takes place, and it turned out to be New York City, where Phil Leotardo is. The game is set in a replica Manhattan, and you play as a corrupt cop, which led to a boycott of the game by the real-life New York police commissioner, citing damaging and offensive depictions of law-breaking police officers. They had a lot of money to throw at the game for things like a voice cast of Lawrence Fishburne, Christopher Walken, and Mickey Rourke. The A-lister budget was supplemented by in-game product placements by brands like Puma Shoes, who sponsored a Banjo-Kazooie-styled exclusive mission, where you had to find all 10 Puma RS100 sneakers scattered throughout the city, with the reward of an exclusive outfit at the in-game Puma store. And you can go buy those RS100 sneakers at a real-life Puma store, from the Puma marketing director himself, from the skate kids to the hipsters and fashionistas, gaming is the common denominator to a widespread audience and a distinctive medium for Puma to utilize to interact with consumers. How romantic. True Crime NYC sold bad and brought about an abrupt end to the series after just two games. So throwing a ton of money and resources at a derivative project does not guarantee success. Cleaver was top-loaded with a beefy budget, a literal Baldwin, and promotional hats and mugs, but it was always destined to become a one-printing type of deal. New York is the phantom over Christopher's shoulder for this indulgent Los Angeles trip. Chris's attention should be back on the East Coast. New York City. Because this is a face-to-face -face business, and with the looming threat of New York on the horizon at all times, Christopher can't just be taking these sabbaticals and expecting everything to continue on hunky-dory in his absence. Then there's the one and only mid-season finale, where Christopher makes a good score getting his car detailed. So you're not going no place. We can watch a DVD. I got the 50 Cent movie down in my trunk. They were giving it away at the car wash. This 50 Cent movie, Get Rich or Die Tryin, came out in 05, and was written solely by Sopranos all-star writer-producer Terrence Winter. Terry Winter also has sole writing credit on the PS2 game 50 Cent Bulletproof, which released that same year of 05. Apparently some wise guy was arrested in Little Italy carrying a few grams. Which wise guy? Who? Have you ever seen those new uh, MP3 players that all the kids have? I know, I know. Your kids love them. How much, McVigor? One day you'll learn that money ain't everything. Right, and you'll teach me. A PSP version of the game with a top-down camera was released the following year, 50 Cent Bulletproof G-Unit Edition. Terrence didn't stay on staff for the next-gen Middle East sequel game, 50 Cent Blood on the Sand, which sold a lot worse than the first game, stopping the 50 Cent game series in its tracks. The same fate as the True Crime series of games. But it doesn't end there because in a different scene of this car wash episode, the 50 cent homage continues. Chris and Juliana are Netflix and chilling while enjoying the 50 cent branded vitamin water. Matt Bumpensiero is right again. They are also smoking crack, which is one of the products that 50 cents underground empire sold to its community as a means to get rich or die trying. This next Easter egg isn't a video game, but as a digital-only media presence, it earns an honorable mention. Noah is a film buff, but on the bright side, it meant he was into Film Threat, a movie review publication that began as a photocopied zine in 1985, but as of Noah's scene in Y2K, they had already switched to a digital-only format. Film Threat was founded by critic Chris Gore, and your YouTube feed may have recommended his entertaining rants speaking truth to power about the modern epidemic of bogus storytelling. The Film Threat YouTube channel has a pretty great theme song jingle that might even be sung by Chris himself. His candor doesn't have to walk on eggshells to preserve industry alliances. So what Chris does with movies is basically what I do in the domain of video games. And by the way, I livestream three times a week on this channel you're watching now, playing a whole lot of Sonic and Mario, plus of course Halo and Mega Man Battle Network 3. Speaking of which, did you catch the musical Easter egg during the Meadow business suit scene, where Tony's mouth doesn't even match the song he's singing? Sitting on the park bench. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Well, it does sync up Pink Floyd's style with a song from Justin Blundetto's game. Remember the part when the trench coat man appears in the park telling the kids to go home and jack in? Well, this park has a bench, and if you find the right song in the soundtrack... Sitting on the park bench. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Sitting on the park bench. 
show. For some supplemental Mega Man lore, Ben Saint has a series Deep Dive, and that's 8 hour content done right. He's more recently done reconnaissance live streaming to research the Battle Network games specifically, and the project pertaining to that research could materialize any day now. Next up, let's approach Carmela's stand-ups from a different angle. He was taking promotional items and selling them, movie posters, stand-ups. Standees. This vestigial cardboard technology got a throwback Thursday homage in Super Mario Bros. Wonder. In online play, you can erect a standee to serve as a helpful save point for another player. The Mario voice actor you heard in Season 1's kart session did not make the cut from Mario Wonder, but the developers dropped the reveal trailer without disclosing a staffing change, watching from the shadows as the public reacted with confusion and conflict. The NetLore podcast pieced together a great deal of evidence to make sense of this situation several weeks before the official announcement of Charles's title change. And that video podcast remains as the definitive review of lore regarding Charles's series exit. And they do pronounce Mario the authentic Italian way, like Patsy. Chicken Mario? Fifteen years of Chicken Mario. Can't you try the veal chop or something for once? What are you giving me a hard time for? I like the chicken. at the final segment, a lightning round. First up, Salvatore's arc resembles that of the Sega Saturn in the American market, a console that gets the nod in episode two. The two of you are climbing over that fence and shagging those plates. If the razor wire. Then, one of you stays with us while the other goes out on the street and boosts another satin. If your family visits Corrado's house, make sure you're not coming in and out of the house. It's rude to treat his kitchen like In Grand Central Station? You gotta lighten up, Corrado. Come out of my balls! I gotta get out of this house! The activity hub at Junior's house has Bobby Jr. rocking his Game Boy Advance, but he shouldn't be anywhere near the phone speaker. They need to have a Shamu meeting. And wow, you seriously thought this show only had three episodes with GBAs? While vibing with John Schwinn, rappers, and a satellite boxing match, a youngin' on the couch has his portable console of choice. John Schwinn is one of the show's rare voices of reason. His metaphysical monologues are credible, since he can accurately assess the value of Sonic spin-off games. Oh, I hope you got some sleep. I was cutting farts like Sonic booms. <laughs> Beyond John, the show's primary moral compass is Charmaine. If you were thinking it was Melfi, you're not alone, because even Lorraine Bracco herself got it wrong. You have to watch the show more than twice to discover Jen Melfi is the template for Kim Wexler. No, you I just told you, you get a little bored with your life so you come down and roll around in the dirt. Have some fun with slipping Jimmy. Oh, is it fun? Like lying to the Speaking of something different, there are two Sesame Street games that use the Xbox 360's Kinect motion sensor technology, where you are the controller. Their release dates meant they could not appear on The Sopranos, but Bobby and Polly made it right. Not to worry, right, my good friend? I can handle this. Cut! Cut, 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 Oh, like this. <laughs> oh, what are you, still not? It's like this. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, what are you kidding? I could do that. <laughs> this has been Alex Yard broadcasting from Massachusetts. Oh, Massachusetts! <laughs> These works had the biggest impact on the contents of today's experience. And 100%ing this video does require that you experience each from beginning to end. And here's a glimpse of the games of that kind, although playing these is fully optional in order to platinum this video. It's more for informational purposes, like what am I going to do, not tell you? If you've seen the show a lot, you could be concerned that season 1 is corny, season 5 is strange, and 6 is just plain depressing. However, Meadow knows a better way. I gotta ride with Alex. I ought to tell you about Christopher's cleaver hat. It's part of a great theory that Felicia told me. Felicia told him.
New Jersey Turnpike. 